Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast, coming to you live. Uh, beautiful Labor Day weekend from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, you know, we we spend a lot of time focused on a lot of new technologies and a lot of new things going on and you know new business models and software and so forth and and every once in a while it's good for us to to sort of stop and you know put some things in perspective and and you know remember you know what's going on in the industry as a whole take a look at uh you know where vendors are making revenue and see where companies are, are staying alive and then look at, at look at transitions as well and and so this week we thought uh, you know it'd be a good time to, to sort of stop and pause and um, you know have a look at at one of the really big conferences that go on in our industry and and uh, you know some some transitions that are going on in our industry so uh, excited to have uh, with us you know back for a second time but but good friend of the show uh, Keith Townsend welcome back thanks for having me Brian and uh, I thought you were, you know, Aaron and I did not for the first time in about uh, probably eight or nine years, did not get a chance to go to VMworld. You were out there all week. Not only uh, you were helping out the guys from uh, the Cube, you were on as a, as a guest host. You were doing stuff with Tech Field Day. You were out there as a practitioner. So I thought you're about the best person to get, you know, a lot of good perspectives on what happened at VMworld. Yeah, it was a great show. And it was, uh, as you said, is an industry in transition. So I'm, I'm really interested kind of in your take and, uh, and sharing this, I think is going to be an interesting topic and overall conversation. Yeah. So, you know, I was kind of watching the show from afar, you know, and, and the nice thing about it is, we can watch a lot of stuff now, but at the same time, there's there's a million things to keep up with. So you, you don't see everything. And obviously, when you're not there, you don't get the hallway conversations. What was your, you know, you're, you're back from Vegas now. You've kind of decompressed a little bit. You know, what are your kind of initial thoughts? I don't know, on, on a bunch of stuff. I mean, everything from, you know, where's VMware going to, uh, you know, I saw you, you were at an event uh, talking with the folks from Docker. So there's, you know, some containers and cloud native stuff. And uh, you were at another event around the sort of next generation networking and, uh, you know, NSX plays a role there. Give me your thoughts on a few of those things and then we'll dive into them. Yeah. So really interesting. The, one of the common themes throughout the show, when you're talking to the folks in the bubble, you know, our community of Tech Field Day or uh, cloud native people or Docker folks, you know, folks who are on the bleeding eggs is that it was a boring show. The, for the Not necessarily boring, but nothing sexy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I talked about this in a cute write up that or wrap up that VMworld this year didn't need to be sexy. They just needed to give a coherent strategy on what they're going to do when it comes to cloud. And I think they did that, both cloud and cloud native. I I think there's a conversation around whether or not it's the right thing to do, Mm -hmm. but overall, very cohesive comments and strategy around what is VMware when it comes to cloud and cloud native and what uh, basically they have to offer customers. So, from that end, very good. Uh, I think uh, from the Docker to NSX to their future net event, VMware kind of drew a line in the sand and said, "Here, this is who we are and this is how we relate to the traditional date, data center and this is how we relate to uh, the cloud as we move forward. Yeah. You talked about, you, you know, you mentioned cloud. Let, let's let's focus on sort of that part rather than the, the cloud native stuff because I think in that sense, we're really talking sort of about uh about infrastructure. It's more infrastructure operations types of people than, than, than apps and dev. The thing that I took away from it, um, and I'm trying to kind of, you know, see if I'm, if I'm looking at it the right way was, uh, a couple of different things. Um, you know, they, they, VMware continues to, uh, push, um, you know, for a while it was sort of called software defined data center. I think that's still kind of the core terminology they're trying to use where, you know, whereby they're saying, look, compute gets virtualized, uh, the network becomes much more software uh, instantiated and, and, and managed as, as software, uh, you know, networking and security. And then uh, obviously they're, they're, you know, getting into into storage and, you know, software based storage and so forth and trying to, to say, look, we have all these components of that. Um, but for the most part, that story 
um, you know, is, is, is a kind of private data center, private cloud centric thing. They, they, they seem to get very much away from the idea of saying, Hey, we're going to, you know, have our own competitive cloud, you know, vCloud really never got talked about all week, um, that I really saw. I mean, I think it's, it's much more of them saying, Hey, um, we, we believe a lot of your workloads will be in, in some sort of private and, and managed, uh, cloud environment, hosted environment. And we think the, the operational for model for that is this more integrated software stack. Is that a fair analysis of, of where they're going with that? I think I think you're right that the, in the sense that the SDDC was most definitely the theme of the show still. VMware hasn't abandoned that. And one of the things that took me a while to wrap my head around from a marketing perspective was I saw a lot of SDDC in the cloud. So I can most definitely see where you get the ideal, you know, what is this more of a private thing? And what they're proposing, as I could see, was a private cloud, your private SDDC spread across public data centers. So one of the things that you didn't get a chance to see because you weren't at the show was uh, during the press analyst session, Pat talked through, he expanded through kind of what he talked about on stage, some of the stats that the VMware team went through. And what they're finding is that their customers are basically using public cloud as they would a um, as they would a private data center and they're not using cloud APIs. I, I challenged them on the cloud API piece a bit, but uh, even talking to Verizon during the future net conference, the sub conference at VMworld this year, mm-hmm. uh, that's exactly the challenges that they're trying to solve. They have their cloud native stuff that they're trying to do, which we can get into, but more specifically, you know, the 90% of their applications that they're not refactoring, that they want to run in both their private and uh, public uh, clouds, they're looking for help solving those challenges. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, that's an area that I think if if I look at it, uh, you know, wearing sort of my old analyst hat or even just as anybody viewing the industry, it feels to me like that's a huge kind of black hole in terms of, of, of what's really going on. And let me, let me unpack this a little bit. So um, you're right. Uh, you know, and if you watch the sort of first day keynote, um, Pat tried to lay out, Pat Gelsinger tried to lay out, you know, his perspective on where are people putting applications? Where do they run today? Where will they, you know, where will they potentially run in the future? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things they highlighted was, uh, some work they're doing with IBM's cloud and, and putting some customers workloads in IBM's cloud. Um, but what's, what's interesting to me is, so you've, you've got VMware who obviously has a ton of insight into what people are doing, um, kind of saying, Hey, yeah, the public cloud exists, but like you said, you know, how are people actually using it? Um, a- another dimension you have is you have somebody like, like Gartner and their, their magic quadrant that comes out. And it is, you know, it's becoming increasingly sort of a two horse race. It's, it's Amazon and Azure. And then, you know, dozens of companies are sort of down in the bottom left. Um, and it makes you sort of wonder like, what's for, forget about Amazon and Azure for a minute. Cause you know, we, we can see what's going on there. We see their numbers at least a little better than we used to, but what is going on in that sort of managed cloud, managed hosted transitional thing um, you know, cause we, we, you know, the other thing we saw last week or week before was, you know, we saw Rackspace going to, going to go private, which, you know, has something to do with, you know, their economics and so forth. What, what, do, what do you hear from that part of the world? Did you pay attention to that part of it at all? Yeah, that, that's the thing. And I agree with you that it, it is a black hole. And, and this is the part that I can say that VMware is kind of putting all his chips and in, in this basket to say that, you know what, infrastructure and Google made this comment that infrastructure is going to be hybrid for the next 20 years, that the pace at which enterprises build applications that use or consume cloud native APIs and, and, and serverless computing. And I had a really interesting conversation with uh, VMware's execs over cloud native computing and NSX uh, that, customers are going to have this need at the volume that's going to keep a VMware like business running because the interesting thing is, you know, Rackspace ran into this problem of 
how big is this how big is this addressable market right. i think vmware believes that that addressable market will be large enough that it can sustain their business in the nsx vsan and vrealize parts of their business uh, big enough to drive that big machine and that's an interesting bet mhm yeah no it, it was you know when you when you look at uh so you've got the the big dell merger which is taking a a huge chunk of the industry private you've got you know rumors of of hp talking about taking parts of their business private uh you, you know so you, so you've got a lot of that going on um you know it feels like we're we're going to end up seeing two things happen on the sort of private data center side of things one of them is um and, you know and, and then you've got you know, you've got all these companies trying to do uh you know hyper converged and consolidated stuff like nutanix so you're going to have two things going on you're going to have this uh massive massively um, competitive market for people basically trying to replace the existing infrastructure of those environments, right? And and whether it gets just replaced with, uh, you know, the thing that you had before, or it gets replaced with some sort of converged, hyper-converged thing will, will be sort of one trend to watch. Um, but that feels like a lot of replacing existing stuff. And and the other thing is with, with all these companies going private and, and seeing private equity play a role is, I think we're going to have a couple year period here where we're going to lose a lot of visibility of, of who's doing well. And, and we're going to have to put up with a lot of innuendo of, you know, some executive sent a tweet and said, Hey, we're really kicking butt out there. Or, uh, you know, somebody making a bold statement in a, I don't know, CRN article and saying, Hey, we're number one and whatever. And, and we're not going to have any real data to, to go by because, you know, once companies go public or, you know, private, um, you know, you, you sort of lose some trust as to what they're announcing because they don't, they're not obligated to, to give any transparency. Well, you know, cloud transparency has been tough yeah. to begin with. You know, you look at Oracle cloud numbers, according to Oracle, they're number two in cloud. And right, right. We all, you know, we all laugh at that. But there's also this uh, piece of it that we can't deny, which is some of this legacy business is, is still good business, but not good good enough business to be on the street. Right. So, the, you know, the Dell piece and the EMC piece, I think those were really great for those types of businesses that probably won't grow or, mat- or matter of fact, will shrink, uh, but are still solid businesses and are great for private equity. Right. And then you have businesses like VMware, which isn't expected to shrink anytime soon maybe uh the, there's some the, the growth would slow but as a street business vmware is still a solid business and it begs the question with the competition from the nutanixes of the world and and uh simplicities and even cisco with where they're moving in a very public manner with cloud and their cloud capability how do you measure kind of from a cut? And this is specifically from a customer's perspective. You know, we look at these th- these things. Where is the excitement from the street in these businesses from uh, VMware versus a Cisco strategy? How they do on the street is just as not. I wouldn't say just as important as the technology, but it's still a, a major factor. Yeah. Well, and it's and, and it should be because you're. You know, you have the dichotomy of, of we look at vendors on a quarter by quarter basis because that's how the street measures them. But the products they sell, you know, have to have a three year, a five year, a seven year sort of roadmap because the people that are buying them are, are you know, betting them around projects that are going to last that long. They're trying to bet, you know, for their career. They're trying to look at technology life cycles. So, um, yeah, I think I think we're definitely at a stage where not only transitionally are we going through a lot of technology change, but but the way we just kind of understand the market is, is sort of fundamentally changing as well. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how people view things with maybe a little less. It, it's interesting. We're, we're going to have less visibility into the traditional businesses and, and the businesses like an AWS or somebody are actually becoming a little more transparent. So um, it'll be interesting to see if that influences stuff. Um, let, let's go back to the VMworld stuff a little bit more. Um, uh, you know, we... For a number of years, uh, you know, going all the way back to, I don't know, 11 or 12 or something, you know, VMware used to say things like, hey, any application that goes to AWS is is forever lost. And, you know, you don't 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 let things go to that bookstore. Um, I was very surprised at how much they openly talked about AWS being legitimate and Azure being legitimate. I mean, you saw it in the UIs of, of various tools they're now shipping. Were you surprised at how much that sort of flipped from a VMware perspective of 
acknowledging that that customers are using these technologies and and that they've got to figure out how to how to play nicely with them as opposed to sort of trying to to block them and prevent them from happening you know what i I did the most i could do to stop from just dropping my jaw as i was interviewing bass guy or the cio of vmware when he mentioned that vmware internally he he lets their developers use aws Mm -hmm. so I think it's one thing to know that uh, head nod, wink, wink, that they do it. But for him to uh, publicly state it and say that, you know what, this is the reality. We've accepted it, that AWS is a critical part of how development, especially development, how development work gets done in an enterprise. And we need to, uh, you know, basically accept that. I'm glad that. Not because it was a bad idea, but because I think it was poorly executed that vCloud Air is kind of put to rest. And th- from a just uh, highlighting and marketing perspective that they're no longer pushing that. But I think VMware has kind of acknowledged what it is. Even the hackathon this year, they had a proper hackathon, but it was focused on what VMware does best, which is infrastructure stuff. So they had hackathon teams focused around doing scripting and things that you can practically do within uh, VMware. And I heard it was much better accepted and um, uh, uh, practically a a much better uh, event than it was last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, You know, uh, Kit Colbert, um, who runs the the cloud native uh, division, whatever it's, whatever it's officially called, um, you know, kind of further talked about their, their cloud native story, uh, which, which basically seems to be, uh, VMware integrated containers. So using, uh, a lot of the underlying VMware constructs, ESX and NSX and, um, and, and going, here's, here's how you can put containers in that. And then Photon platform, which is, you know, sort of their more, you know, container centric, you know, take out some of the old parts. What was, you know, aside from what we saw in the keynote, um, what was what were you hearing uh, from people? What was your take on on their cloud native stuff? I mean, it it, it didn't feel um, as as uh, defensive as as it was maybe a year ago, where it was you know there was a lot of press talking about does does containers replace VMs? It felt very much like a okay, um, you know, I just want to have a conversation with you if you want to run containers. Here's a couple of ways you can do it. Yeah, I think VMware, even, you know, their relationship with Docker, obviously Docker had a presence at TechField Day X. And even from the Docker presentation that I studied, it was, it was uh, introductory and more basic. But again, this is positioning containers where they should be in a data center versus uh, VMs where they should be in a data center. I don't think anyone of those camps, at least not at the show, was trying to say or be on the defensive to say, you know what, you should put all your workloads here. I think uh, VMware is a lot more comfortable after talking to customers around VIG, you know, VMware integrated containers and both uh, the Photon controller and Photon, the OS, around uh, how customers are seeing containers in the data center. I think a lot of the talk was there's still a lot of confusion within the tech spear on why would you do containers inside of VMs at all? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have strong opinions on that. I think there's nothing wrong with, especially in a development sense, wrong with VMs or containers inside of VMs. If I was to do containers in any one of the cloud providers, they'll be inside of a VM. So from a developer's perspective, why should they care? Uh, that I, as I think the industry at large, from a technology, from a practitioner's perspective, we're still a little bit young uh, on the infrastructure t- side of how we manage containers. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, th- there's obviously some levels of sophistication in the industry that, uh, you know, are going on in, in places. Um, you know, I thought when I looked at some of the VMware architecture stuff, at least the little bit that I saw from keynotes and so forth, um, you know, what, one of the things that jumped out at me was, uh, Kit kind of walked through the architecture, and it seemed to me there was basically a one container per VM kind of thing. And, and the, the logic there was basically, well, you know, from a VM perspective, we know how to say, here's how you attach the network to a VM. Um, here's how you can associate storage to a VM. And so let's sort of have this logical one to one association between, you know, a VM and a container. And, uh, you know, forget all the sort of 
architectural ramifications of that. I think it was them trying to say like, look, if, if your goal is to say, um, I want to say can, developers, you can use a container and you're the operations team. Like this was a simple starting point. And, um, but I think it highlights the idea that we're still, we've still got some work to do as a, as an industry, as a whole, to sort of have container best practices, right. You know, widely accepted, widely used kind of baked based on experience and so forth. Yeah, you know, and dipping into the FutureNet conference, which was put on the last two days of the show, which I have to give VMware some kudos for. It was a networking conference that felt nothing like VMworld, and it was very vendor neutral. Right. Uh, we had uh, the guy from Docker that you had on a show a while back. Um, I can't remember. They they did the network startup that Docker. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, John Willis or uh, no, 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 no. I know who, the, the other guy from. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah, know, John I, Willis was the Yamadu, kind of evangelist. Yamadu, yeah, Yamadu. Yamadu. Yep. And uh, they had Google and they had um, Google's t- talking about Kubernetes mm-hmm. and the complexity of, of networking. I was, you know, I listened to those shows, but I never really understood. I mean, Google was really having a hard time with scale with the scale of uh, networking when it comes to containers. So when you flash back to the enterprise and talk through VMware's traditional customers that are thinking about using containers both in a development phase and as a operations tool, I can see why VMware wants to keep the messaging around container, container management. Uh, and this is a big theme of the show. V realized that whole management suite there they push that really really hard but right. i can see why there's the desire from both their marketing team and just from a practical sense to keep container architectures relatively simple so that customers basically don't hurt themselves right well and i, I think we're still we're still at such an early stage um you know p- people can talk about devops all they want and busting up silos all they want and um i mean there's still tons and tons of people with a lot of really good practical experience that look at some of the architectures that are coming out and they're going, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's nice that you can give me an IP address and it's nice that you can do some things in terms of, you know, kind of aggregating some stuff for me, but you know, there's a lot of sophistication that exists in, in why people do stuff at a networking level, at a security level, at a load balancing level that, um, you know, needs, needs to kind of evolve. And, and, and the trick is if, you give all that capability just to like the developers, you know, you sort of go, Hey, you know, if the developers write the code, they should do the full stack. You, you know, you've got a lot of people going like, Oh, it's, it's like giving sharp knives to, to small children. Like they don't know what to do with them. It's, that's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a mistake. And, and why would you, you know, why would you want to get rid of all this experience we have type of thing? Yeah. And uh, some of the comments at the show were coming from both the stage and both events. And I think in the audience and amongst customers is that developers know namespace and load balancers. And right. that's about it. And that's all they care to know. So a lot of the operational expertise will stay there and translating. And this is what Madhu and Docker's position is. And it's complicated. At, at least I want to make it complicated. And I think that shows which, which camp I'm in. And Madhu said that uh Networking in Docker is simple, and networking people want to make it complicated. And I think <laughs> the reality, and Google is saying that it's complicated, but I think the reality is is probably closer to the Google end of it, which is, yes, we need to keep it simple for developers, but in keeping it simple, it makes it really, really hard on the operators to uh, – to keep that simplicity and still allow for the scale and the and the and, and not losing too much in that abstraction, so it's a tough problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I and I think if we just look even back a couple of years, I mean, the idea of when we went to virtualization, you know, networking got hard. It just it, it literally got hard because you have. Um, you know, you, you don't have the one-to-one correlation of, you know, a physical device and a single cable and, you know, you start introducing logical separations and then you start introducing things that move and you start introducing things that can spin up and spin down quickly. And, and all those things, uh, you know, they, they sound awesome, but something has to, to work under the covers to make it so that you can reach them and you can address them. And, um, so I, yeah, I, I tend to think I, I agree there. 
Um, there are problems that there are some very smart people working on and, and that's great, whether it's, you know, the Docker folks doing it natively, whether it's, you know, all the work going on at Kubernetes or, you know, companies like Weave that are doing very cool things. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is, it is sort of complicated and, um, you know, I think, I think people just have to go in there with their eyes open, knowing, you know, sort of what they're dealing with. Um, but let's, let's kind of go back to some of the, the, the other talk that was going on, obviously, um, you know, VMware, uh, wanted to, you know, v- VMware has been fighting very hard for a long time to say, Hey, we're a very independent company. Uh, we, we, we were independent of EMC. Um, you know, that, that, that fence always sort of gets straddled and, and people have different opinions on it, depending on where they live in the ecosystem. Um, you know, Michael Dell seemed to sort of reiterate that, uh, you know, in some of the talks I saw from him. Um, but I also saw him make some comments like, you know, people were asking how he's going to, you know, how he's going to finance this huge deal. And he said, well, you know, between EMC cash flows, Dell cash flows, VMware cash flows, you know, we'll be able to do that. And it was sort of interesting to me because I, I had heard him in the past say, no, 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 VMware is going to be independent. We're not expecting sort of their cash flows to, to cover the, the, the other side of it. What, what did you hear, you know, from people in terms of where they think VMware is going to be is is a are they more independent than they were in the past? Are they less independent? What what's your two cents or what did you hear from people? So I think there's a lot of skepticism around VMware remaining as independent as EMC allowed them to be. Mm-hmm. I went to a couple of customer meetings, went to a couple of analysts and press things where Michael Dell spoke and one of the things that he made specific uh, and made a point to say was that VMware will remain independent. The ecosystem will continue as it is. And one of the very first questions in every one of those sessions was, how is VMware going to change? So I, I think um, the industry at large is kind of, and I think it's very similar. Unlike, you know, VMware wasn't nearly as big as when EMC bought it. Right. Uh, but I think there was a lot of questions around VMware's independence as VMware started to grow and became obviously the crown jewel of EMC, uh, whether or not EMC was going to bother VMware. And for the most part, you know, m- you know, EMC did their part of injecting EMC executives in sure. places where uh, sure. VMware needed to toe the line. But for the most part, they remained uh, fairly independent. I think yep. there's questions around whether or not Dell will have the same level of discipline. And I frankly, I, I, I you know, I'm in a wait and see mode. I, I, I find it hard to believe Dell just traditionally hasn't been that type of company. And I would, I'm just not a true believer in that pure uh, separation between Dell and VMware. Right, right. Well, and, and you know, to a certain extent, I, I think, you know, just historically, people are very weary when people say, oh, don't worry, we're, we're doing an acquisition, we're doing a merger and, and nothing's going to change. Don't, you know, and you just go, man, time and time again, every, every single one of these that, that doesn't necessarily turn out to be the case. And, um, you know, not, not trying to imply that, that they're not being truthful, but, um, you know, the realities of the market are, you know, the market doesn't stop because you do a, an acquisition or a merger, um, you know, to sort of let your, let your strategy take hold. And, and, uh, you know, and, and the realities of, you know, this is a big financial uh, execution. Um, you know, they've got to figure out a way to, to not only be stable, but, you know, uh, you know, leverage synergies and how they sell and all those other things. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's still got to be, you know, a huge question for customers. And I guess the good news is after, what is it, mid-September, October, they'll, they'll start seeing what the actual actions end up being because um, they will end up being, you know, all under one umbrella. Well, it'll be interesting to see if my VMware sales rep still has a MacBook come mid <laughs> mid September. That would be that's a good, I, good starting I, point. Yeah, I've, I'll find that hard to believe, but we'll see. Yeah. So I want to wrap it up with with one last question. Um, you know, one of the the interesting announcements from an innovation perspective, um, not so much just a uh, a momentum perspective, but an innovation perspective was. Um, this thing they called cross cloud services that was that was very focused on um you know essentially this acknowledgement that customers are going to you know run applications in in multiple clouds uh public clouds private or hosted clouds and uh they introduced a bunch of sort of interesting looking uh networking slash security services that are um you know, going to, going to help you network and, and, and make those things secure, 
you know, across multiple clouds, but they're delivering it as a SaaS type of, of offering. Um, so it won't necessarily just be, you know, a, an appliance you install. It's kind of a SaaS thing. What, what's your take when you, when you see these SaaS offerings or, or even this offering? Um, cause it does force it folks to sort of go, Oh, okay. This is a little different. I, I buy it different. It's priced different. Do I see the box that runs the software? What, what's your take on, on sort of these new delivery models? So I think there's a higher tolerance for or yeah a, lot, a higher tolerance for these type of offerings. You know, if you look at platform 9 and other services in the OpenStack realm, we've been doing this for a little bit this SaaS delivery of infrastructure uh management. Uh this stuff is hard. I think we've gotten to the point as enterprises that we're starting to realize that the Efforts, our best engineering efforts and operations efforts should put it be put in areas that we add true value, mm-hmm. or that we have a uh, a legitimate chance of having a deep discipline around. And I think this is one of those areas that as a customer, I probably welcome it as a service versus having have to to bring in a box, uh, staff up to support it and deliver it as a internal service. Uh, this is an area I most definitely don't mind having outsourced to and provide and getting provided as a SaaS offering, especially from a company the size and reputation of VMware. Yeah, yeah, I, I know Aaron and I have both been, uh, you know, pretty bull- bullish just on the general idea of saying, look, um, you know, when you have this combination of technology that's moving really fast, but but you you can pretty easily sort of say, boy, if we could get that capability, uh, you know, as a, as a capability for our IT organization, you know, an IT ops function, a monitoring, uh, helping with network and security, like the faster you can sort of ramp up that learning curve to be able to use it, the, the better. And if it happens to be delivered as a SaaS offering, uh, so be it, you know, we're going to have to learn a little bit of how to, how to weave that into our operations. But, um, yeah, I, I thought it was, that was very interesting because, because obviously that's a, that's a departure from the traditional, you know, way of, of going to market and, and delivering software and then, you know, maintaining software. So um, definitely an area to, to keep an eye on, not only for that cross-cloud security and networking, but just, you know, will will this become a more common thing for VMware? Yeah, the, I think uh, we'll see much more of it across the industry from folks such as Cisco and and this, these big brands, not just, you know, traditional products they've offered in the past. But as you said, these new things that are really hard for the enterprise to staff up on skill wise and that moves quite frankly, extremely fast. Container right. and container management is a is an obvious area that that we'll need help from the bigger v- vendors and trusted partners. Right, right. Well, cool, Keith. Listen, uh, as always, thank you so much for for coming on and giving us your insight. Um, you're doing stuff all over the place. Where can people go? You know, find all your your insight, your you know what you're working on, and uh, you know, kind of keep up with you. Yeah, I'm all over the place, but the best place to find me is on Twitter at CTO Advisor on Twitter. The blog is thectoadvisor.com where you can also find the podcast. So those are the two best places to get me. Very cool. Well, listen, uh, folks, for uh, for Keith and Aaron, thank you so much for listening and uh, have a great Labor Day weekend. And we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 